Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. In this module, when we are discussing issues about status of health and education, in today's lesson we will continue discussing about status of education in the context of India with a focus on a very uh, important and landmark study that uh, came out in India in the 1990s, which was referred to as the Public Report on Basic Education. In the last class, we studied about annual status of education reports, where we saw that uh, different to the uh, official uh, data or official statistics data and the survey reports that we have in India, uh, annual status of education report was some sort of a uh, citizens report of quality of learning and learning losses that we have been experiencing in India. And we studied about how uh, the annual status of education reports have been addressing the problem of learning losses in India. We will continue with this uh, discussion on uh, quality of education today by focusing on this very important study which uh, basically uh, fundamentally uh, changed the way we look at uh, uh, elementary education in India. Uh, this report uh, was a very different kind of a report which was also some sort of a citizen's report, public report, uh, not based upon official data sources but taking references to official data sources and then carrying out um, surveys in uh, four uh, important uh, North Indian states of India, uh, Bihar, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh which constitutes the bulk of the population of the country. And uh, although the report is uh, uh, slightly dated, the first report on the public report in basic education came out in 1999 based upon the uh, surveys uh, carried out in 1996. Uh, but what is important about this report was that it came out at a juncture where we were talking about millennium development. We had begun talking about achievements and uh, um, millennium development goals that were about to come in the uh, subsequent years. And today we are talking about the sustainable development goals. But uh, one has to look at this uh, discussion in the larger context of how uh, we have moved uh, from the 1990s uh, till now. And this report coming in 1999 sort of gave us uh, some uh, status view of how we had progressed from the 1950s onwards. So, this report uh, brought about a fundamental change in the way we understand about elementary education in India. So, in today's class, we will discuss about this report, some of the findings from this report and uh, what were the basic arguments that this report was making that altered uh, our perception about elementary education in India. So, I want to quote uh, a few uh, sentences from the beginning of the report written by an independent consultant S. Ananda Lakshmi who was also associated with the report. So, she said that this report varies in a distinct way from those of the high powered education commissions. It is not a public report made to the government, but a people's report made to Indian citizens. We hear the voices broadcast without distortion or static. Uh, I would encourage the learners to uh, read this report. We will also share the uh, soft copies of these uh, reports on the portal and uh, it will be an interesting read for anyone who is embarking upon uh, research in education, particularly in the context of primary and elementary education in India. So, this uh, report, uh, the uh, design of the report, the contents of the report constitute some of these uh, uh, important uh, chapters. So, first it talks about elementary education as a fundamental right. Then it uh, talks about some facts and myths on elementary education in India. Uh, it basically debunks certain myths surrounding elementary education, uh, myths uh, that had been propagated by learned people in the media and in various writings were dealt with and interrogated in this report. Uh, this report also talked about the school, schooling and the family, how family members how households or families view schooling education uh, in uh, these uh, probe states. Uh, the school environment was also dealt with elaborately. Uh, this uh, report, the team uh, which constituted writing of this report referred to as the probe team and the probe survey states, they uh, held elaborate discussions with uh, teachers, uh, how uh, teachers engage with students in the classroom what is their view about uh, society at large and how they are engaging with children coming from different social classes and castes, 
what happens inside the classroom how teachers engage with the class uh, with the uh, children in the classroom was an analysis which was elaborately taken up in this study and with the help of various stories from various states in simple language the information was given out to the readers through this report aspects of education management was also dealt with in this report uh, school management uh, committees and how they are dealing with uh, children in the classroom uh, how school management takes place what are the problems in school management uh, some of the then recent developments such as the mid day meal schemes which had just begun on a mass scale in india uh, the shiksha karmis alternative schooling private schooling uh, these issues were also dealt with elaborately in this report and this report ended on a very positive note by focusing on the schooling revolution in himachal pradesh uh, which had by then already emerged as one of the best performing states uh, in education attainments after kerala and therefore uh, it ended on a very positive note by concluding that change is possible and uh, reforms with regard to uh, teacher engagement quality schooling uh, quality pedagogy etc should be brought in so it is in this uh, with this background let us now uh, get to know some details about what was the basic argument of the probe report now uh, before we do that let us also place some stress on the probe states and the survey method that was uh, undertaken uh, by the probe team now in most of these uh, classes that i am taking on uh, the reports as part of uh, economics of education you will notice that i want to focus on how data has been collected by these reports it is important for us to understand the data collection procedure because it tells us a lot about the robustness of reports and in the indian context often we focus on official statistics or official data there are of course data brought out by various other private agencies and so on also but uh, uh, in the context of health and education some of these reports which have very resilient data collection mechanisms survey methodologies uh, help us to uh, uh, draw uh, important conclusions which are reliable and which are uh, replicable and from which major arguments uh, can come up so uh, therefore while we focused on the annual status of education report survey methodology let us also focus on uh, a bit let us begin by looking at the uh, survey methodology that was adopted by the probe team so which are the probe states the probe states were uh, bihar madhya pradesh rajasthan and uttar pradesh so uh, we are talking about 96 to 99 when madhya pradesh was uh, still not bifurcated Uh, into Madhya Pradesh and uh, Chhattisgarh, so we are talking about undivided Madhya Pradesh then. And in each of the states, the study was carried out at the uh, village level. The focus was on rural areas and impoverished families particularly. So in each of the states, the districts were grouped by uh, female literacy status based upon the census 1991 data, and sample districts were chosen from each group. it followed a stratified random sampling procedure for selection of villages now this survey used a subsample which was already available from the national council of applied economic research uh, because the ncaer had carried out some village studies in 1994 which was just before very recently uh, when in 1996 when the survey was being carried out so the reference was taken from the ncaer village uh, studies that was carried out in 1994 and that subsample of villages was utilized by the probe team and it was extended further we will presently see how it was extended now so therefore the survey refers to this as an extended subsample now within the selected districts villages were then chosen randomly among all the ncaer villages in the 300 to 3000 population range now remember that when we are looking at the subsample here uh, where uh, the probe team uh, took uh, the subsample from the uh, ncaer village study this already uh, shows us that some amount of robustness in maintaining of data or uh, the uh, quality of data that we uh, are going to see in probe uh, survey is uh, reliable because the national council of applied economic research follows uh, robust methodology to conduct its village surveys 
so from these NCAER villages, the probe team chose villages uh, which uh, mostly were in the range of 300 to 3000 population. And this size restriction of villages was done to ensure that each village was large enough for a primary school to be uh, viable because remember that the probe team wanted to focus on elementary education in India which is till class 8 of education. So, they wanted to focus on primary schools uh, where children are from class 1 to class 8. Now, what was this extended sample? From the NCAER uh, sample list, the probe team took uh, about 122 villages. They selected these 122 villages and the size of this subsample was extended to include at least one neighboring village or the nearest village within the same 300 to 3000 population range. And this was called the extended subsample basically to increase the sample size. So, altogether they did a sample survey of 188 villages uh, of which 122 villages were taken from the NCAER sample. And uh, this way 236 schools with primary section uh, which constituted 195 government schools and 41 private schools were studied in these four northern states. Now, uh, also a small note about the sample households, in the 122 villages uh, using the house listing uh, instrument of the NCAER survey. Now, this house listing instrument is basically the list of households uh, that are in each of these villages which are utilized by uh, survey agencies, government or private in carrying out detailed surveys. So, this contains uh, detailed information about the households, sometimes uh, brief information about the households which helps the surveyors to be able to carry out further uh, sampling based upon the house listing uh, instrument. So, uh, in 122 villages, uh, the uh, probe team used the house listing instrument that was available with the NCAER and 12 households from each village was surveyed. So, 12 households from each of the 122 villages were surveyed and uh, these households were selected by the method of circular random sampling. Circular random sampling is basically a method of sampling where every third household or every fifth household is repeated so as to ensure that the sample is representative of the entire population. And household surveys were however not carried out in the subsample of neighboring villages which the probe team had added as part of the extended subsample, but all because uh, the house listing instrument was not available for those villages. But for the 122 villages that were uh, taken as a subsample from the NCAER survey, household surveys were carried out which went into providing us information about what is the parents view of uh, elementary education in India. Since the main focus of the household survey was on primary schooling, households without any children in the age group of 6 to 12 was not uh, included in the survey and this way altogether 1221 households were surveyed by the probe team from the northern states. Children were also constituted a subsample, uh, interviews were done with uh, children and uh, the information collected from the children gave us uh, their perception about how they are viewing elementary education and this is one of the biggest contributions of this report because this report uh, was way ahead of its time in terms of providing us both the parents and children's view about uh, what they are expecting out of elementary education or why they are not being able to continue in elementary education in India which, which sort of uh, try to address the uh, official perception that people uh, in uh, influential circles had about uh, uh, elementary education in India, about how parents and children view elementary education in India. So, there were three subsamples of children in the age group of 6 to 12, those who are currently enrolled in schools which was about 1066. Then there were dropouts uh, from schools about 106 uh, children and those who were never enrolled about 226. Uh, now Himachal Pradesh was uh, visited by the probe team to highlight the uh, major changes taking place in Himachal Pradesh. As I mentioned in the beginning of this lesson that by this time Himachal Pradesh had already emerged as one of the best performing states as far as education attainments was concerned. So, uh, some districts in Himachal Pradesh were also studied by the probe team to uh, compare it and uh, conclude about 
uh, what best was carried out in Himachal Pradesh that brought about better results and which could be probably replicated in other uh, states of India. So, the survey in these selected states and districts were covered between September and December 1996. Now, what was the aim of this probe report, the public report on basic education? Uh, there were uh, some of the aims of this report needs to be highlighted. So, based upon field work, detailed and elaborate field work in these states, the probe survey basically attempted to present a picture of the schooling system, uh, the way parents, children and teachers experience it. So, the experiential learning of uh, the most important stakeholders of the school system, the teachers, the children and the parents. Uh, their experiential learning was highlighted in this report and therefore, uh, this report was referred not just as a public report, but people's report. So, people's own idea about how they want elementary education to be or how they are experiencing elementary education. So, this report was written from the point of view of the underprivileged millions of children who are out of schooling system and their parents and was based upon the premise that elementary education is a fundamental right of every child and guaranteeing this right is not just a matter of welfare or development, but one of social justice. So, one of the highlights of probe report as I had just mentioned was that was, the, was to highlight the success story of Himachal Pradesh uh, as compared to the other four states to uh, give hope that change is possible. And it is possible if all of these stakeholders come together and increase community engagement and participation in schooling in ensuring uh, schooling outcomes or learning at the school level. So, let me uh, now discuss about an, a very important uh, matter that was brought out by this probe report, which was to uh, put in context the public view on universalizing elementary education in India. Now, possibly the learners would know that uh, constitutionally in India, elementary education is guaranteed by the directive principles of state policy uh, that uh, every child till the age of 14 years uh, should be in uh, enrolled in schools and they should be provided free uh, education at least till the age of 14. But uh, that is the constitutional aspect of uh, guaranteeing education. But there is also a public view on uh, whether elementary education should be universal or not. And there are many people in official circles who hold a view about who should be receiving education. Uh, there are many people in uh, the uh, non-official circles also it is assumed that they have ideas about universalizing elementary education. Uh, if not now, at least in the 1990s, the, the discussion surrounding this idea was uh, very acute. So, this report began with discussing about the public view on universal elementary education, which I think is a very interesting addition to the discussion on uh, education attainments. Let us begin with that. So, the report argued that India committed to free and compulsory education for all children until they complete the age of 14 years, but even until the 1990s, uh, there was a notion that it is not essential for all citizens to be educated. So, probe survey identified this sentiment as one of the reasons why public commitment to universal education was half-hearted. Although there was a constitutional guarantee for providing uh, education or universalizing elementary education, the public sentiment was one of whether it is necessary for all children to uh, have uh, to universalize uh, elementary education or whether it is necessary for all children to be enrolled in schools, whether education should be need based or not. So, this is where uh, probe identified this public sentiment that uh, one of the reasons why elementary education could not be universal was that the public commitment to universal education itself was very half-hearted. So, the probe team observed that even among teachers, there were persons who considered education as unimportant for children of the lower classes. Now, these are the kinds of perception building that happens in schools and community, which so far we did not have any um, elaborate reporting on. And therefore, it is in this context that the probe report of 1999 is was hailed as a landmark report. So, another variant of this view of um, uh, the fact that it is unimportant for children uh, for uh, of the lower classes to 
uh, appear uh, to be in schools was that schooling is irrelevant for some children because the curriculum and teaching methods are inappropriate. And probe team referred to these kinds of views as rejectionist views about uh, educating children. But they uh, observed that these kinds of rejectionist views about educating children was not really seen among the parents interviewed by the probe team. So, with this context, the probe team uh, made a case for universal elementary education with a few arguments. Now, let us look at some of those arguments. The first argument is of course that uh, elementary education in India is a fundamental right, it is a constitutional directive and therefore, it should be implemented. The second was that they observed that there is a popular demand for uh, universal elementary el education. It was a myth they pointed out that poor parents are not interested in education because the team found that there is a widespread and growing demand for universal elementary education. Uh, the third argument was that of human capital uh, where the idea of education being a form of human capital was not just uh, uh, shared by eminent economists or sociologists or social scientists and people in the official uh, policy making circles, but uh, the probe team argued that this idea of education being uh, human capital was widely shared by parents as well. So, poor parents viewed education as important for economic success and particularly in the probe states, education of boys for securing job was a priority among poorer parents. So, without being rejectionist of the materialistic view of education, whether or not education is important or unimportant, uh, probe argued, argued that one needs to acknowledge the demand of poor parents for economic security through the route of uh, securing education. So, that was an important highlight of this report that poor parents also value education for education's sake and also because it provides economic security uh, in the way of securing jobs and so on. The fourth argument that probe report made with regard to universalizing, making a case for universal elementary education was the simple joy of learning among children. Children who are taught in a supportive environment enjoy the schooling experience, uh, they enjoy the friends that they have, the play and the study and in uh, one of the earlier lectures also we have seen that the very act of socialization is an important uh, uh, driver of schooling uh, and uh, success of schooling among uh, children. So, the, the simple joy of learning itself empowers people with various other kinds of capacities and uh, that makes a strong case for universalizing elementary education. Fifth argument is that of individual well-being. We have earlier studied about creation of minimum capabilities, how education is not just uh, demanded for the sake of human capital, but also because it uh, contributes to individual well-being because there is evidence that education greatly helps to achieve good health and to protect children from diseases and also we have looked at various other uh, minimum creation of capabilities that education helps us with. The sixth argument was that of social progress, the benefits of education are compounded over generation and we have sufficiently dealt with this issue when we looked at the public good or the social good aspect of education. Seventh argument was that of political participation, while some kinds of political action require little education, but in general uh, we have seen that literacy and education are important tools of effective political participation when it comes to say for example, informed voting or signing a petition or organizing a protest or just contributing to public debates. And finally, the social justice argument of universalizing elementary education. India has obviously had a long history of education disparities uh, due to uh, social inequalities based on class, caste and gender and there is a powerlessness associated with being illiterate uh, in modern societies and uh, probe uh, survey and the team highlighted this uh, very importantly and this being one of the reasons eliminating this sort of powerlessness, the basic powerlessness that comes with illiteracy as one of the arguments for why parents and children view education uh, positively and uh, also as a tool of social change and uh, individual well-being or changes in the uh, levels of living at an individual level as well. So, so far what we have studied is that uh, probe uh, report was a landmark report 
and it sort of uh, made a case for universalizing elementary education based upon these arguments. There was another uh, important contribution of the probe report that was on emphasizing uh, certain facts and myths that are prevalent in the context of elementary education in India, particularly in the context of how the society engages with the debate of public education or how the officials engage with the debate on uh, public education. So, let us look at some of those points now. Now, before we can do that, when uh, the probe team uh, made a case for universalizing elementary education, they also provided certain counter arguments for uh, dealing with these uh, uh, negative perceptions uh, or the opinionated perceptions about universalizing elementary education. So, for example, the perception that universalizing elementary education is pointless as long as school pedagogy is not liberating or is used as a mode of social control. There were many experts who had opined that the policy of universalizing elementary education will not hold any uh, value or will be pointless because the school pedagogy itself is erroneous and it is not liberating and therefore, school pedagogy can be used as a mode of social control. And this is another radical view about uh, universal education as a policy, uh, which uh, many uh, social scientists and sociologists have uh, made about. The probe team argued against this uh, perception uh, by saying that this limitation applies to the entire schooling system, including privileged urban schools. And uh, therefore, uh, this pedagogical critique, however, should not be made in a manner where it becomes a case for then tolerating the exclusion of underprivileged children from the schooling system. So, the basic idea is that if one becomes rejectionist of universalizing elementary education and then rejects uh, the policy of universalizing elementary education because it is of no value or because it can be used as a tool of social control. Uh, then why should that be applicable only to poorer households for whom creation of basic minimum capabilities leads to elimination of powerlessness say. So, it is in this context that the probe team argued that this limitation if it applies, it applies to the entire schooling system, even the urban schools, privileged schools and so on. But then uh, to use this pedagogical critique uh, to keep the underprivileged children out of schooling system is unjust. So, a case for pedagogical improvement in schooling system has advantages, but it should not be used as an argument for withdrawing all children from it, because if that argument is made, then the ones who are at the receiving end are mostly the impoverished and the underprivileged children, who uh, do not receive any benefits of education whatsoever and particularly in the context of economic security. So, that was a very powerful argument made by the probe report. Uh, similarly, they also talked about uh, liberating experience of education and how the liberating experience of education operates in different ways. So, learning to read and write can actually do a great deal to liberate children from the sense of powerlessness experienced by illiterate persons in modern societies. Even when these skills are acquired through routine methods, even if there are pedagogical limitations, the achievement of being able to read and write and engage in public debates or engage in social uh, change or social uh, issues itself uh, is empowering and therefore leads to elimination of powerlessness among illiterate people and that is also the liberating experience of education. Uh, children often benefit from associating with other children in a school environment even when the content of learning is of limited interest. And uh, Probe argues that some educationists take the view that socialization experience has much greater educational value than the formal curriculum. So, the benefits of socialization can lead to uh, better creation of uh, human capital or add to human capital can have greater education value than the limited uh, learning experience provided by the pedagogy. So, these were a few counter arguments that the probe team made in response to the radical view about universalizing education as a policy or pursuing universal education, elementary education as a policy uh, is pointless as it has uh, uh, features of social control or uh, fractured pedagogy and so on and so forth. Now, 
The another contribution of the probe report as I said was about discussing certain facts and myths regarding uh, the uh, elementary education situation in India then. So, let us look at some of them. The first fact is that of low achievements. Now, the probe survey analyzes that India's success with higher education particularly in the domain of production of great scientists, doctors, uh, writers, economists, sociologists has given the general impression that we are generally doing very well in the field of education achievements. But the census of 1991 and the uh, National Family Health Survey of 1992-93 which was the inaugural NFHS survey actually showed very low education attainments. So, which also uh, indicates uh, very high levels of inequality that was already institutionalized in the Indian context where there were very low achievement levels as far as elementary education is concerned, but stellar achievements uh, limited though in the context of uh, higher education. Around the time that the first probe survey came out, 61 percent of women and 36 percent of women uh, above the age of 7. Uh, were unable, 36 percent of men, I am sorry, there is a error on the slide, 61 percent of women and 36 percent of men uh, above the uh, uh, age of 7 were unable to read and write and only less than 30 percent of all adults had completed 8 years of schooling. About 23 million boys and 36 million girls were out of school and international comparisons also did not show India's position very well. So, even uh, since the 1950s uh, when, um, uh, when interventions in education started uh, began and uh, despite the constitutional guarantee of uh, compulsory education, even up until the middle of the 1990s or the late 1990s, India did not really fare very well as far as education achievements is concerned. The first fact is that we were already grappling with very low achievements as far as education is concerned. So, for example, if you see here compared to South Korea, Sri Lanka and China, the male and female average years of schooling for those who were age 25 and above was very low. In South Korea, uh, 11 percent uh, of uh, men and 7 percent of female had about uh, 12 and uh, 7 years of uh, uh, education. Uh, but uh, the uh, average years of schooling in India for men and women was 2.9 and 1.8, which means on an average uh, men in India had studied for about 3 years and women in India had only achieved about 2 years of schooling. And we were also not uh, very well standing up compared to other countries like Sri Lanka and China. So, international comparisons was also showing up. Uh, particularly the human development reports of the 1990s that uh, we were facing very low achievements as far as education is concerned. If you look at education attainments, uh, so the NFHS data which came out on 1992-93, the left hand side chart, you will see that uh, the uh, number of illiterates in India as far as men and women are concerned, uh, 38 and 70 percent. We had 70 percent illiteracy among females. Uh, and if you look at the achievements, so illiteracy basically refers to some deprivation. So, we were deprived here, uh, number as large as 70 percent of women were illiterates uh, in 1992 uh, 93. And if you look at achievements, we had not very great achievements. Uh, those who were literate and below class uh, 5, it was only 7 percent for women, also very low for men. Uh, class 5 completed 9 and 15 percent for women and men and so on. You see beyond class 10 uh, also were 3 percent for females and 9 percent for men. So, we had the overall levels of educational attainments were very low. And for the probe states, the achievements was even lower and the deprivation was even higher. So, compared to 70 percent illiteracy among women at the all India level, for the probe states it was 82 percent. Uh, illiteracy among men was also higher in the probe states and the education attainments among men and women age in the uh, education category was also lower compared to the all India status. So, that was the first fact that the probe report discussed. The second fact was that there were very high disparities as far as elementary education is concerned. Today, uh, we talk about disparities in higher education, uh, but 30 years back we uh, spoke about uh, 
uh, very high disparities in um, yeah, primary education and elementary education as well. So, Indian educational achievements were highly uneven and the literacy rates varied greatly by region, caste, class and gender. And the probe team argued that the probe states were consistently worst performers. Yeah, during this time, India had one of the highest gender gaps in literacy rates as was highlighted by the Human Development Report of 1998. Only five countries had a higher gap than India and they were Bhutan, Syria, Togo, Malawi and Mozambique. Rajasthan in India alone had a large population as all these countries combined and no country in the world had a higher female male literacy gap than Rajasthan. So, uh, some of these states were already within India were already showing very high disparities, uh, particularly with respect to gender based disparity in literacy rates. So, the left hand side uh, chart here shows literacy rate in Kerala in uh, 1991 census which was about 96 percent, uh, rural Kerala had literacy rate of 85 percent. Uh, and they were uh, the literacy rates were higher than the Indian averages which was for urban area 73 percent and rural 45 percent. Of course, the numbers have gone up uh, quite a lot today. But if you look at uh, the achievements within scheduled caste population uh, for rural India it was only 33 percent, rural India scheduled caste among females it was only 19 percent and Rajasthan which had seen very high. Uh, gender gap as far as literacy rate was concerned one of the highest in the world. The female literacy rate among the scheduled caste population in rural areas was only 5 percent. So, the fact was that there was very high regional disparities not just regional gender based and caste and class based disparities as far as education attainments was concerned. And female education was a consequence or lack of education was a consequence of uh, neglect. Now, if you look at uh, the black bars show India and the white bars show for probe states, female literacy uh, age 7 and above in 1991 for India was only 39 percent, probe states 24. Uh, in the age group of 15 to 19, uh, 55 and 37, uh, proportion of districts where majority of women in the 10 to 14 age group are literate, for India it was 65 percent and the probe states was 27 percent. Uh, proportion of women aged 25 plus who had completed 8 years of education, which is basically completing elementary education. The numbers was very small for India, that was this was for all women, proportion of women aged 25 plus which means that women who were in the reproductive age group or women who were in the working age population, the numbers were only 14 percent at the all India level and 9 percent in the probe states. So, the overall uh, elementary education attainments in India was already at a very low level as well as the disparity was very high. The third fact was that we were making very slow progress in these attainments. The uh, probe highlighted the progress of universal elementary education as being very slow in India. For instance, the increase of literacy rates was so slow that the absolute number of illiterate persons was still rising year after uh, year at least till 1991. And But since the 1950s, many other Asian countries had overtaken India in literacy rates. So, on the left hand side you see the number of illiterates in India from uh, 36 uh, uh, point, uh, one crores to about 84 uh, point, uh, six. and uh, this one talks about the total population and the black bars uh, talk about the number of illiterates age 5 plus uh, which was also the absolute numbers were rising between 1951 and 1991 and the dotted line shows the rise in total population. And these bars shows the rise in number of illiterates age 5 plus in absolute uh, numbers uh, in crores. The right hand side shows the literacy rate in China and India in 1990-91. Uh, now, if I begin with the age 60 plus, you would see that Indian literacy rate was higher than that of China. But as you move towards the younger age groups, China had already surpassed India in 1991 as far as literacy rates is concerned. For all the other groups except 60 plus age group, uh, China had already made uh, much advancements as far as education is concerned. So, for example, in the 15 to 19 age group, uh, India's literacy rate was 66 percent, in China it was already 95 percent. In the 20 to 24 age group, we were 58 percent, China was already 94 percent. 
uh, even in the 40 to 44 age group Indian literacy rate was 42 percent was China was already 80 percent. So, the point is that in between these years of the 1950s and the 1990s there were other countries who had already made much progresses although we began at similar stages uh, similar uh, proportions there was something better in those countries which brought about faster rates of education attainments. The fourth fact was that of state inertia highlighted by the probe report. In India, elementary education is a shared responsibility, it is on the concurrent list and state governments are the main actors. So, the quality and reach of schooling varies from state to state and the report highlighted that there is official neglect in many states of India, but a few states have overcome this official neglect. Uh, they highlighted the example of Kerala, which has a long history of public involvement in the promotion of education. Major initiatives uh, were also taken in Tamil Nadu and Himachal Pradesh, but the official apathy in the probe states was very, very resilient and continued. Now, the another interesting contribution of the probe report was debunking of myths uh, in the context of elementary education. The first myth pertained to the fact that poorer parents are not interested in education. There was a general myth that uh, among official circles particularly influential official circles that it is not possible to universalize elementary education because parents are simply not interested in education. And uh, the probe argued that the myth of parental indifference was astonishingly high in official circles where it provided a convenient rationalization for India's low schooling levels. So, one of the reasons for India's low schooling levels uh, was made out to be because parents are not interested and the report cited a uh, few media reports written by eminent social scientists who had earlier opined that although there is a general awareness among people that education is a basic right, but the vast majority of adult literates belonging to the poor economic stratum are not convinced of uh, education. So, the probe report argued that such opinions were not built on evidence from the ground. To quote probe, in contrast to this supposed indifference, we find that even in the probe states where parental apathy is likely to be most widespread, most parents attached importance to their children's education. So, some of the questions of the probe team posed to the uh, parents to assess parents attitude to education were as follows. Uh, is it important for a boy to be educated? 98 percent uh, said a yes and uh, to the question is it important for a girl to be educated? 89 percent in the probe states had said yes. Uh, should primary education be made compulsory for all children, 80 percent had said yes. So, this general, the myth that parents are not interested in education, uh, primary education or education of any level does not stand according to the probe team. The second myth that had an overbearing uh, uh, influence on the minds of people was that child labor is the main obstacle for education attainments at the elementary level being very low. So, the probe argued that the belief that children most uh, out of school uh, children are unable to study because they have to work is a myth. So, the widespread belief of child labor was largely due to uh, full time child labor in specific occupations such as carpet weaving in Mirzapur or bangle making in Firozabad. But probe argued that many reports on child labor and utilization of children's labor is vastly exaggerated and the magnitude of the problem is vastly exaggerated because the data on labor force participation from the census, NSS and probe survey indicated that only a small minority of Indian children were full time uh, laborers. So, if you look at the chart on your right hand side which shows estimates of child labor, proportion of children aged 5 to 14 who are in the workforce who have identified themselves as a worker. Uh, in census of India, the numbers of female and percentages of female and male were 8 and 10, NSSO 1993 showed 7.8 and 6.9 and the NCAER survey of 1994 showed 3.5 and 4.4. So, the myth that child labor, the scale of child labor in India is huge and because of uh, child labor, elementary education attainments have not been um, possible uh, was found to be uh, misplaced. 
uh, probe argued that such kinds of views actually misrepresented the nature of work performed by child laborers because the vast majority of children probe argued worked as family laborers at home or in the fields but not as wage laborers. So probe also reversed the argument by saying that instead of child labor being the reason for children being out of school it is actually the reverse that is children are in full time wage labor because of being out of school. So because of the failure of implementing universal elementary education children are in workforce and it is not the other way around that parents are not interested in education or children are in uh, workforce and therefore they are not going to schools. The third myth uh, pertains to the fact that elementary education is free. There was a general notion that elementary education is free and despite it being free if poorer parents are not sending their children to school then that is because of all of these associated factors that probably they are interested in child labor or they are not interested in education and so on. So again this myth was also debunked by this report because it was seen that elementary education is free in a restricted sense meaning that while admission fees in government schools are negligible but in a more relevant sense even elementary education involves a lot of expenditure on the part of parents. I did not see emphasis on tuition fees in this uh, report but apart from the expenditure that people make on sending children to school, uh, buying books uh, and uh, spending on bags and other things, the uh, probe report found that the expenditure uh, made on sending children to elementary school was also relatively high. Uh, surveys have indicated that the cash costs of education play a major role in discouraging poor families from sending children to school especially when the quality of schooling is low. When quality of schooling is already low and people have to spend on education then of course the difficult decision of uh, keeping children out of school is often taken. In this context a lot of literature on low fee private schools have also come up in India and it is an emerging area of research as well. Now I want to quote a few lines from the probe survey report uh, which suggests about high expenditures on elementary education. The probe survey suggests that North Indian parents spend about rupees 318 per year this was in 1996 on fees, books, slates, clothes etc. on average to send a child to a government primary school and this is a major financial burden especially for poor families with several children of school going age. So an agricultural laborer in Bihar with three such children would have to work for about 40 days in the year just to send them to primary school. Note that during this period the minimum wages were also very low in many states of India. And even at rupees 318 per year, the average child goes to school with scanty clothes and a depleted school bag. Only a minority of children, for instance, were found to be in possession of all the textbooks corresponding to their grade. The average expenditure of rupees 318 per year was well below the real needs. To give some context to this rupees 318, I also want to point out that the inflation rate in India between 1996 and today has been about 465 percent which translates into a total increase of 465 rupees. So this means that 100 rupees in 1996 are equivalent to 565 rupees in 2024 and considering this average annual inflation rate uh, rupees 318 in 1996 translates to rupees 1798 approximately in 2024. Now the fourth myth was that schools are available, the lot of schools have come up, uh, schools are available and still uh, parents are not sending children to school. So the obvious conclusion in the official circles that probably parents are not interested. But Probe argued that even if the physical distance between homes and schools had gone down due to increase in number of schools, the social distance taking into account the various barriers that may prevent a child from reaching a local school has not been bridged. So to quote in many areas for instance villages are divided into hamlets and children from one hamlet may be reluctant to or unable to go to school in another hamlet due to for example caste tensions. And these uh, kinds of features were seen to be more acute in the context of the North Indian states, the probe states. Well, now uh, second point is that while primary schools had gone up the infrastructure availability for middle schools was still lacking. So which prevented the constitutional guarantee of education till the age of 14. 
In rural areas of India, then 43 percent of population lived more than one kilometer away from the nearest upper primary school. And adverse terrain is often a major obstacle for small children, particularly in the Himalayan terrains, because single teacher schools and also single teacher schools, lack of basic infrastructure, quality of teaching can also be major impediments. I will move towards the concluding part of the lesson now, where we will discuss about the highlights uh, of the probe report with regard to parents' views on education, the children's view on education. So, the probe report showed that rural parents were not passive or indifferent about their children's education, rather they were active participants in the education process with very clear expectations and hopes for what education could achieve for their children. So, this report emphasized the need for policymakers to address the quality of education to meet parents' aspirations. Some of the key findings with regard to parents' views was that uh, one is that they uh, highly valued or the high value the parents placed on education. Second was there was a lot of frustration with regard to quality. Many parents were frustrated with poor quality of education available in government schools. They were concerned about irregular teacher attendance, inadequate teaching methods and lack of basic facilities which um, adversely impacted the learning experiences of their children. Third was the willingness to sacrifice by the parents. The report highlighted that many parents were willing to make significant sacrifices to ensure their children received an education. And this included sending their children to private schools or making efforts to keep them in school despite economic hardship. Uh, there was of course a demand for better schools because they were not satisfied with the mere availability of schools and they wanted schools where their children could learn effectively and ultimately secure a job. Uh, gender equity was a major challenge. More parents were willing to send their daughters to school by recognizing that education was important for both boys and girls. Now, as I said that uh, another important contribution of the probe report was to highlight children's views on education, how children engage with education and what is their perception about education. So, the probe report provided important insights into children's perspectives on education. Uh, which is often overlooked in broader discussions about the state of primary education in rural India. Uh, and the report highlighted that children like their parents had their own views and attitude towards schooling which shaped by their experiences in the education system. So, first is value of education. Uh, the report found many children valued education and had very high ambitions. They were aware that education can provide them opportunities for better future, for better jobs and this was particularly true for older children who had a clear understanding of potential benefits of education. There was also a genuine desire for learning especially in subjects that they found engaging or where the teacher was effective. Uh, there was frustration with quality among children, boredom and disengagement. Um, many children reported feeling bored and disengaged and this was largely due to rote learning methods commonly used by teachers. There was disillusionment with schooling uh, as the children grew older some became disillusioned as they felt they were not learning anything useful. There were physical and social barriers, there was also the challenge of being able to balance school and work uh, and there was a preference for better schools among children. Uh, there was a private school preference, children who had experience with both government and private schools often expressed a preference for private schools. They perceived private schools as offering a better quality of education, more disciplined environments and more attentive teachers. And even though attending a private school often meant uh, additional financial burden on their families, children recognized the difference in the learning experience. Uh, but despite these challenges, there was a lot of resilience and optimism uh, and the optimism motivated many children to continue attending school despite obstacles and uh, girls education was also viewed very positively. So, overall and there were many more aspects that were discussed in the probe report which we will not be possible to discuss it as a part of this lesson. Uh, but the report concluded that children in rural India generally recognized the value of education and had a strong desire to learn, but their experiences were often shaped by the inadequacies of the education system. The poor quality of teaching, lack of infrastructure and social barriers led to frustration and disengagement, but the report also highlighted the resilience and optimism of uh, children. Now, there was a second uh, a survey that was carried out which was titled Probe Re Revisited after a decade of the first probe report in 1999. 
uh, that uh, the publication of the probe report in 1999. I do, do not want to go into the details of this report, but just to highlight what was the objective of this probe revisited report. It was a follow up study to the original report uh, and the objectives were to reassess the status of primary education in the same areas covered by the original probe study to evaluate the impact of educational reforms and policies implemented since the original report, uh, particularly the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan and Right to Education Act, which had already come in by 2005, to analyze changes in enrollment, attendance, infrastructure, teaching quality and learning outcomes, and to capture the perspectives of parents, children and teachers on the changes in the education system. So, just to highlight some of the key findings of probe revisited, uh, with regard to enrollment and attendance, one of the most significant positive changes was that there was a dramatic increase in school enrollment by 2011, particularly among girls and children from marginalized communities. And this gap between boys and girls had actually narrowed down substantially. There was also improved attendance rates, uh, which was noticed, especially although there was some irregular attendance, uh, um, uh, especially during agricultural seasons or when children were required to contribute to family income. Infrastructure improvements were also seen, better school facilities were available, more schools had proper classrooms, drinking water, toilets and basic teaching materials. Um, although the, despite these improvements, many st uh, schools still lacked adequate facilities. Uh, there were issues like overcrowded classrooms and insufficient teaching materials. Uh, quality of education, there were ongoing challenges with learning outcomes. Uh, many students continue to struggle with basic literacy and numeracy skills, which have also been highlighted by the ASAR reports that we discussed in the last class. Teacher absenteeism and teaching quality uh, reduced, but it was still an issue. The quality of teaching had not improved significantly, which also uh, raises uh, the question about providing attention to uh, teacher training and teaching quality in uh, government schools. There was also a divide between private and public education. Probe Revisited found a continued and growing trend of parents opting for private schools even in rural areas and this was driven by the perception that private schools offered better teaching and a more disciplined environment. Um, there were perceptions about government schools, um, the, while government schools had seen improvements, they were still often perceived as inferior to private schools. Uh, there was positive influence of the SSA and the RTE. Uh, the introduction of midday meal scheme was particularly successful in improving attendance and addressing child uh, malnutrition. So, uh, let me uh, end this lesson by uh, uh, discussing that the probe report or the public report on basic education, uh, although not an official statistics report, provided us uh, very important findings from the uh, probe survey on how uh, parents, teachers and children view education and the importance that they provide to uh, elementary education and improving quality of elementary education. And this report uh, provided us uh, with uh, uh, ideas about uh, the facts and the myths that were prevalent in the uh, elementary education scenario in India. And uh, this, after the uh, publication of this report, uh, uh, many uh, changes were also seen with regard to uh, perceptions in the official circles that had an influence uh, on how education should be designed within our society. So, since then we have seen many improvements in education attainments and also uh, the way we want to argue about elementary education in India. For this uh, lesson, I refer to the two reports, the original probe report uh, uh, and the second uh, report which was titled probe revisited. And as I mentioned in the beginning that we will share these reports with you on the portal and I hope we can have a discussion on this in the upcoming live sessions also. So, with this, uh, thank you. See you in the next class. Mm -hmm.